Hello, everyone. My name is Christian Stuckemeyer, and welcome to Online Worship with Trinity. If you're new here, welcome. Uh, we'd love to connect with you and help you learn more about our church. The best way to do that is to fill out the Connect card, which is linked in the chat. We'll follow up with you once you fill out the Connect card to help you get connected further here at Trinity. If you haven't taken a moment to check in, please do so now before we begin worship. You can check in with the Church Center app, which you should download if you haven't already. It's the best way for you to stay connected to Trinity by checking in, managing your giving, registering for upcoming events, joining groups. So please download the app as we're getting started. Let's begin our time of worship reflecting on God's character and why he's worthy of praise. Listen to these words from the psalmist in the book of Psalms, chapter 103, verses one through eight. Praise the Lord, O my soul. With all that is within me, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Do not forget all his kind deeds. He is the one who forgives all your sins, who heals all your diseases, who delivers your life from the pit, who crowns you with his loyal love and compassion, who, who satisfies your life with good things. So your youth is renewed like an eagle's. The Lord does what is fair and executes justice for all the oppressed. The Lord revealed his faithful acts to Moses, his deeds to the Israelites. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. He is patient and demonstrates great loyal love. Please join us in singing our first song. Yes. 
Let me add my word of welcome to all of you joining us today. I have a couple of announcements for us before we continue on with today's worship. Discover for the month of July is coming up next week. Discover is our new members course series that takes a look at Trinity's mission, vision, and values that takes place once a month, typically on the third Sunday of every month. July's will be on Sunday, July 17th, following the last service at each site. So if you would like to begin or continue your journey through Discover, please register in the Church Center app or contact Zach Gates for more information. Also, if you've been through Discover and would like to attend to support those who are going through the process, we strongly encourage you to register as well. We're looking forward to seeing you there. Today's reading comes from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 22. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that, when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Welcome back, Trinity family, as we are continuing in this series that we are calling Letters for Exiles. And the reason why we've called this series that is because the experience of exile is one in which people feel displaced from what is comfortable and what is familiar. And for that reason, we really felt like these letters speak to us today because of how much everything seems to be upended and uncertain. That even in our own communities, even in our own society, everything that we thought was predictable suddenly seems to be turned inside out and upside down. And that's where these letters from 1st and 2nd Peter are so important because Peter wrote these letters to churches that found themselves in a world of constant change and of increasing uncertainty as they looked toward tomorrow and, and the days beyond, wondering what was coming next. And yet in this letter, what we find is that he has words of encouragement, words which help us to understand what it means to be people who bring hope, peace, and joy, even into a world that feels like it's falling apart. And so we're going to be kind of continuing in that series this weekend, but I think it's only right that we take a few moments to allow God to prepare our hearts and our minds to receive the message that he has for us. So would you please bow your heads and pray together with me? Let's pray. Lord God, we give you thanks that we are indeed gathered together as your people, that we might come to understand what it means to walk with you, even when everything around us seems so uncertain. 
And so Lord, we pray that you would give us open hearts and minds to receive the message that you have for us. And Lord, I ask that the words of my lips and the meditation of my heart would be pleasing in your sight, O God, who is indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, if you've got your Bibles or maybe you have your uh, scripture journals uh, with you, why don't you go ahead and open up? We're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 8. Now, last week, we talked a little bit about how we are called to engage with the wider world. And what Peter tells us is that the way that we interact with those around us is through loving acts of service that point others to Jesus. And we do this not just for fellow Christians, we actually do this even for people who don't share our same religious convictions. Our desire is to be loving servants who care for everyone around us in a way that points them to God and to his love and his grace for us. But then that raises a question that I often hear from many people. They say, so what if I serve sacrificially and it doesn't go well? What if I serve sacrificially and and people take advantage of that? And I think that part of the reason why we ask that question is because we fear that if we are to serve others, we'll, we'll suddenly become a kind of doormat. Or we fear that serving in this way could lead to our harm rather than our good, especially if we are serving those, as Peter acknowledges, those people who might be unjust or who might take advantage of those circumstances, but really at its heart. I think underneath it all is the question of how we handle suffering even when we're doing the right thing. How how do we handle suffering when we're living the way Jesus calls us to live and life suddenly doesn't get that much better? And I think all this comes from the fact that we have a misunderstanding around suffering and blessing and what it truly means to live the Christian life, which is why I'm very excited that we're diving into the passage that we have for this weekend, because that's exactly what Peter is addressing here. Uh, One of the things that that we tend to see in our society today is this idea around suffering and blessing being two opposite ends of a spectrum. Uh, We tend to believe that suffering indicates that, that God is against us, or suffering comes uh, as a result of something that we've done that's wrong. And in many ways, this is very similar to how people in the ancient world thought when it came to suffering. You see, people in the ancient world believed that if you were suffering, it was because you had offended the gods. Or if you were suffering, it was because uh, you did something to violate like the natural law and the natural order. Suffering and blessing were two opposite ends of the spectrum. And again, I think that's something that a lot of modern day people tend to believe when it comes to suffering and blessing as well. I mean, I think about one of my favorite movies. It's a movie uh, with Jim Carrey called Bruce Almighty. And it follows the story of this guy, Bruce and, uh, and Bruce is a television reporter, but he wants to be an anchor man. And he's, he's dating uh, his girlfriend and he wants to get married, but their relationship is just kind of a little off. And, and throughout the whole first portion of the movie, uh, Bruce takes everything bad that happens to him as a sign that God hates him. And at, at one point, he even yells at the sky. He says, smite me, oh mighty smiter. Because he has this idea that if bad things are happening, it must be because God doesn't like him. If, if life isn't working out the way that he thinks it should, it must be because the forces of the divine are standing against him. And of course, the comedy in the whole film is that God actually shows up and gives Bruce the ability to, to basically have his powers and to do whatever he wants with his life. And he, and he finds out that actually it doesn't go so well. It doesn't actually work out the way that he thought. But, but while it's funny to laugh at that, I, there are many times when I've been talking with people and, and they are going through hard times and they start to say things that sound an awful lot like this movie. They start to say things like, why is God doing this to me? Or has God abandoned me? Or does this mean that he hates me or that I've done something wrong? It's this idea that suffering and blessing are two opposite ends of the spectrum. Which is why it's really interesting to note what Peter says in our passage for today. I want you to listen to this. He says, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble 
mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. Whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. See, what's so strange to us as modern people is how Peter puts suffering and blessing together. Right side by side. He says, you may suffer, but you're also blessed. And, and we just don't have a framework for thinking about that because of this idea that we hold on to that somehow suffering is for when you do bad and, and blessing is for when you do good. Which means that we need to kind of redefine how we think about blessing for a moment. Uh, and specifically, what we need to understand is that when the Bible talks about blessings, it doesn't mean material comfort or ease, nor does it mean that life will always work out according to the ways of the world, where suddenly we'll be protected from things like hardship or struggles or disaster. Rather, Peter says that true blessing, according to God's plans, is totally different. In fact, he highlights that there are two things that believers receive in the midst of suffering that actually reshape and redefine what blessing actually means. And so I want to take a look at that uh, for a second to see what those two things are. The, the first thing that Peter highlights is he says that the, the first thing that believers receive that helps totally redefine what blessing is all about is they receive a closer encounter with God. Here's what I mean. Take a look at verse 12. He's quoting from Psalm 34, and this is what Peter says. He says, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, again, we kind of read that with our modern perspective and we say, well, see, look, it says that God blesses and, and loves the righteous and, and he hates the evildoers. So why does it seem like even when we do good, things get harder and people around us who are just living according to their own selfish ways seem to prosper? But that's not really what Psalm 34 is saying. What Psalm 34 is saying is that God is near to those who are righteous. He's attentive to their needs. His eyes are on them. His ears are open to them. And what Peter says is he says, the first thing that we need to understand about blessing is that true blessing, at least biblically, true blessing is experiencing the presence of God. Now, let's be very, very clear here for just a moment. He's not saying that God is closer to those who suffer and further away from those who are doing well. That's not what he's saying. But what he is saying is he's saying when we suffer, when we go through hardships, we are suddenly much more aware of God's presence. And I think the reason why is because it's in moments of hardship that we realize we need something more than ourselves if we're going to get through it. When we finally come to the end of ourselves, it's in those moments that we realize just how desperately we need God. And suddenly, when we become aware of that, we realize he's actually not that far away at all. I love how C.S. Lewis puts this in his book, The Problem of Pain. He says this, he says, pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. See, what Lewis is touching on is this reality that it's in our sufferings and in our difficulties that we realize that God is not far off at all. That as we come to the end of what we can do, we suddenly realize that there is a God who is there with us, who meets us in our sufferings and provides for everything that we need. And I'll be honest, as I thought about my own story, what I find is that my, my the seasons in which I feel closest to God are often the most difficult seasons. I think about when we uh, were sent down to, to seminary in St. Louis. That was not actually a planned move for us. We actually hoped that we could, you know, stay here at Trinity and that I could finish my seminary degree while we're up here in the Chicagoland area among our community and our family and friends. And when we found out that that door wasn't really open to us and that our only option was to go down to St. Louis, 
it led to no small amount of turmoil. We were leaving behind the church that we loved. We were leaving behind friends and family. We were going to a city that neither one of us had ever lived in before. And we basically had to start from scratch. And yet, when I look back on that season, that was one of the most fruitful times of life and ministry for us. We were living in a community where we were getting to know people who didn't know Jesus and building friendships with them and enjoying life together. We actually got a chance to see a couple of them come to faith as a result of that. We ended up building some friends who've now kind of become lifelong friends that we stay in touch with as a result of our time down in St. Louis. But it was because it was this moment of difficulty that we realized we need God even more. And the beautiful thing is it's in those moments of suffering that we suddenly realize God is there. God is with us. God is with you. God is, is not absent in the midst of our difficulties and our sufferings. That's the first thing that we need to realize when it comes to blessing. The way the Bible talks about blessing is blessing is, is knowing God and experiencing his presence. There's a second thing, though, that, that Peter highlights about what God gives to those uh, who trust in him that helps redefine blessing, and it's this. He gives us an opportunity for witness. Hear what Peter has to say uh, as we move into uh, the rest of the passage. Let's take a look at verse 15 for a second. He says this, "'In your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy.'" always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. See what he says here is he says, actually it's in the midst of your suffering. You actually have an opportunity to give reasons for the hope that you have to others. I actually love how the commentator Edmund Clowney puts this. He says this, he says, suffering is not the opposite of blessing. Peter would prepare the church to find in persecution an opportunity for witness. And what I would argue there is, is also Peter would, would prepare the church to find in suffering an opportunity for witness, that it's actually in our hardest moments that we have an opportunity to let the light of God's good news shine brightest. Here's what I mean by that. People naturally start asking questions when bad things happen to good people. They start to ask questions like, so why is it that these terrible things are happening, especially to this person who seems like they're doing so much and, and, and doing things to serve other people? But then the questions get even deeper when they see those very same people facing that suffering with confidence, strength, and peace. That when good people encounter suffering and they do it with confidence, strength, and peace, people around them start to wonder, what's different about you? What is different about who you are and, and, and where you look to for your hope and your confidence? And again, I think uh, maybe a personal story will help with this one. I remember when my grandma Doris passed away. She had been sick for quite some time and we knew as she kind of came into her final weeks that she was getting close to the end. And it finally came down to the point where uh, she, she was sleeping uh, all day. She wasn't really waking up or becoming responsive. And eventually the hospice care nurse said, you should all come out to her apartment and be with her. This is probably the day when she's, when she's going home. And so we went with uh, my family and members of my extended family, and we just sat by her bedside as people started to arrive. And eventually at one point, uh, my wife, Jenny, and I, we, we sat down and we said, you know what, let's, let's pray. Let's pray for Doris. Let's, let's pray for the ease of her passing. Let's pray that she would get to go home and be with Jesus. And we just sat down and we started to pray. And as we prayed, suddenly the hospice nurse says her, her heartbeat is starting to, to become more spaced out. Um, it's more sporadic. We think she's getting close. And so we gathered up uh, the other members of our family and we gathered in a circle around her and we said a prayer. And then we started to sing a hymn. And as we came to the final verse of that hymn, the hospice nurse said, she's gone. She breathed her last and she went home to be with Jesus. It was a very powerful moment for us and for our family, but then something crazy happened. That hospice nurse right afterwards, as everybody else was giving each other hugs and comforting one another, came up and grabbed me by the arm and said, I need to talk to you. And Jenny and I sat down with him and he says, you know, in all my years of, of being a hospice nurse, I've never seen anything like that. What just happened? 
And we had an opportunity over 25, 30 minutes. So we were waiting for the funeral home to come and collect her body to just sit with that nurse and talk to him about Jesus. And in fact, what I ended up doing is, is right as the funeral home arrived, I, I, I rushed home and I got a copy of Mere Christianity and I actually brought it back to the nursing center and made sure that it got into his hands so that he would have a chance to read a little bit more about Jesus and the hope that we have in the resurrection. You see, in the midst of suffering, we actually have this opportunity to participate with God in bringing blessing to others by sharing with them the reasons for the hope that we have in Jesus. You see, in short, true blessing, according to Peter, is nothing more than this. True blessing is knowing God and participating in his purposes. That's what real blessing is, according to the Bible. It's knowing God and participating in his purposes. Knowing that even in the midst of our sufferings, he's not far away from us knowing that even in the midst of our sufferings, he can use that through us to bring good news to other people. That's really what it means to be blessed. That's how Peter is able to put blessing and suffering together in a single sentence. It's a paradigm we desperately need in our world that tells us that good things come to good people and bad things come to bad people. That's just not the way the world works. And yet what the Bible dares to say is even in the midst of our broken world, God can bring life transforming blessing not in spite of sufferings, but actually through them. But that's why the next portion of this passage is so important because sometimes that's hard to see. Sometimes the suffering seems so overwhelming, we feel like we we just can't be a good witness. Sometimes there are moments when we've been suffering so hard, all we can think about is ourselves and, and we have a hard time turning around and and pointing other people to Jesus. And and we can get discouraged and be like, oh man, do I not trust God enough? Does this actually mean that, that he doesn't really love me and that I'm not really a follower because in the midst of my sufferings, it's just so difficult and so hard to continue to move on, which is why I love what Peter says in verses 18 to 22. He says this, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven. And it is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. See what Peter says, he says, in those moments when suffering seems so overwhelming, you need to realize Jesus has the victory. That Jesus has suffered. He knows what suffering is like and he's overcome suffering. And you now have hope in him and in his victory. I think that's part of the reason why he talks about spirits and angels and authorities and powers, because the reality is, is he wants us to understand that in the midst of suffering, Jesus is in charge of everything in the physical world and the spiritual world. He has all power and authority. He has victory over those things. And I think that the reason he brings up the Noah story is is really as an example. I mean, think about the Noah story for a second. Noah was told to do something crazy for God. He was told to build an ark on dry land because rain was going to come. And I have to imagine that, that people in ancient times just laughed at him for being nuts. And sometimes in the midst of our suffering, when we're saying, I believe that God is with me, that Jesus is with me, when everything else around us seems to be following up, falling apart, people kind of look at us and say, that's nuts, that's crazy. But then what Peter says, he says, but remember, Noah was vindicated and saved. His salvation and his relationship with God carried him through. And then he goes on and he says this, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. What he's saying is if you're a follower of Jesus, it means that Jesus' victory is your victory. The hope that Jesus won for us is ours. And even if the world looks at us having faith in the face of our sufferings and says, that's, enough, uh, that's, that's, that's crazy, that's nuts, we can know where our hope truly lies. It's in the victory of Christ who ultimately will overcome all suffering and all brokenness because we know the end of the story. 
Not only did he walk out of his tomb in resurrection power, but he promised to come back. And and I love what the final pages of the Bible say. It says that on that day, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more crying or suffering or pain anymore for the old order of things will have passed away and behold, the new will have come. And when Peter draws them back to their baptism, he's saying, you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus' victory is your victory. That suffering does not have the last word. Suffering does not have the last laugh. And because of that, not only will you endure, but that good news of victory is one that you can hope in, rest in, and share with others around you. So that even when you're weak, he's strong. Even when you feel like you're failing, his victory holds firm. Even in those moments of doubt, you can know with certainty that Christ is on his throne and Christ reigns. That's where our hope ultimately lies. That's ultimately what we look to. We are saved by Christ as an act of grace, which allows us to face even the most difficult seasons of suffering with a kind of hope and peace that not only can carry us, but can bless those around us. And that's the hope that I think Jesus would want us to have today. To know who you are, that you are baptized in him. To know who he is, that he is your victorious savior and Lord. To know the hope to which he has ultimately called you life eternal. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks that even in the midst of suffering, your victory stands firm. And that suffering and blessing aren't two opposite things, but actually, Lord, we experience blessings even in the face of suffering, blessing which can transform and overcome even the darkest seasons of life because we know that you are with us and we can part- still participate in your purposes of bringing hope and new life to others. And so, Lord, we pray that in those moments of difficulty and challenge and darkness, struggles and trials, that our hope is ultimately found in you. And that we can proclaim that good news with gentleness and respect to a world that so desperately needs to know of your love, your grace, and the hope which truly surpasses all understanding. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen.
Justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. Praise with him to endless life. He will hold. From the 9th to the 13th, 19 of Trinity's youth and adults will be traveling to join the approximately 20,000 youth from all over the country for the National Youth Gathering in Houston, Texas. Please join me in a word of prayer over them in their travel to Houston and their time at the gathering. Merciful Father, through holy baptism you have made us your own possession. Grant that our lives may evidence the working of your Holy Spirit in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, according to the image of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Lord, we give you thanks for these youth and their leaders, knowing that you have gifted each one of them as a member of the family of Christ. Equip them and open their hearts and minds for the opportunity to grow in their relationships with God, each other, and unknown new friends. And in all things, Lord, teach them the secret of being content in all circumstances, knowing that they can do all things through you who strengthens them. Lord God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending by paths as yet untrodden. Give them faith to go out with good courage, knowing that your hand is leading them and your love is supporting them through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Please join me in the words Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Once again, I'd like to thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again next week.
family and your children and their children and their children. May His favor be upon you and a thousand generations with your family and your children and their children and their children.